Thank you, and thank you all for being here. Uh, today I'm going to talk about how to train your own large language models. A little bit about myself, um, working on something new at Lexi AI. Uh, I led the data and AI team at Replit prior to this, and uh, on, on that team we trained Replit code v13b and other LLMs completely from scratch. You may have seen uh, in the tweet about uh, Databricks acquiring Mosaic, they actually used our, uh, our blog post as justification uh, for how the two companies fit together very well. And uh, this is a blog post that covers LLM training at Replit, our process, our architecture, and it's a lot of what we'll go over a bit today. Um, the, these are LLMs that are for code completion, so they power uh, Ghostwriter, and Ghostwriter is Replit's uh, competitor to, to Copilot. So I would love to get just a show of hands how many people here use Copilot or are familiar with it. Oh, wow. Majority of the room. So um, then you're all very, very familiar or should be very familiar with code completion, AI, and how that works. Um, we also built Ghostwriter Chat and Debugger, which was the chat GPT within your uh, REPL style uh, of Ghostwriter and then build site-wide code search as well. And I'll talk in a bit about why that's relevant to training your own models. So why train your own LLMs? Uh, I'll list all this slide for me, from me for the keynote, so he already went over these. Uh, the ones that I'll call out, uh, the main one that everyone, or, or the main reason everyone wants to train their own is customization. And that means different things to different people. It really depends on your use case and what it is that you're trying to get out of an LLM that you can't uh, currently do with GPT-4, Anthropics Cloud, or, or anything else. Um, the, the main reason that we did it at, at Replit was cost efficiency. And cost efficiency, um, it, it depends obviously on your business model, all of those types of things. But the one case where it actually pretty consistently will be cost efficient to train your own is any kind of autocomplete use case. And so with autocomplete, every single key press is basically sending a request to the model. And uh, it's just not financially viable if you have uh, you know, over 20 million users the way Replit does and, and you want to send API requests at every single keystroke. So a quick overview of the process. I tend to break it out into three different sections, the first being data pipelines, then model training, and then finally hosting an inference. Um, there's obviously way too much material to cover in, in the 40 minutes or so of, of this talk. Um, so I'll try to jump into certain areas uh, of the process and, and do a bit of zooming in to learn more about why they're important. And, and I'm going to try to prioritize sections of the process that weren't actually covered in the blog post because you can always uh, go back and read some of those details uh, within, within the blog post. So this is just a diagram of, of the various portions of the process. Um, <laughs> Naveen presented this slide at the keynote. He took my best slide, so the rest of the talk is a bit of a sleeper, unfortunately, for all of you. And um, this shows the, the flow of the data pipelines, everything that's done in, in Databricks, where some of this data comes from, the, the fact that it's then moved over to Mosaic for training or streamed over to Mosaic for training. Uh, and then I'll talk a bit about our inference stack, which we had built in-house uh, previously. Yes? Um, I have on my screen, it's white. I don't know if the color appears differently. <laughs> I don't control the lights, or maybe I do. I think someone's on it. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'll keep going. Yeah, I think they're working on it. Um, okay, so I'll. I'll keep going, uh, we'll come back to that slide as well, and there'll be areas of it that are, that are zoomed in, or specific areas that we'll zoom into as well. 
Um, so the, the data source is going to be the stack. This is a large collection of, of permissively licensed code made available by the good people at the Big Code Project. And this is available on Hugging Face, both as a dedupe data set and the original uh, on, on a in Parquet format. So we pull this down, um, store it in Databricks, and then we do all of our processing on uh, Databricks. And so this includes any pre-processing of data, the transformations. Um, it allows a lot of increased control compared to the Transformers library, which is what Hugging Face uses. Um, Transformers is a great library and it has uh, these, these methods that allow you to um, abstract away a lot of the, the parts of the process, such as working with large data sources, but we actually want that control and, and to be able to um, control more of the process, especially the transformation process. Um, Databricks also makes it easier to introduce additional data sources, including proprietary data sources that are unique to Replit and not available on on sites like Hugging Face. And then the entire process is tractable and extensible because we do a lot of this work in, in notebooks. Um, and here's an example of some of that work. We uh, wanna make sure that we have a really good sense of what's actually in the data. Uh, anyone that's trained these models will tell you a big part of the process is just cleaning up data, removing um, a, a lot of junk that you don't wanna feed into your model and a lot of the larger shops like you know, OpenAI, Anthropic and whatnot, they've built up this knowledge over many years of training these models of the types of things to, to look for. Um, we try to do that in a very transparent process, kind of log all the different um, filters. So for example, if we're tagging Python files that are auto-generated, we'll wanna dive in and look at what these files are, whether it makes sense. Does it uh, point us towards any other types of things that we should be filtering? Um, and, and all of that we do in Databricks notebooks. Then I'll quickly go over the, the pre-processing steps. This is pretty standard kind of um, uh, data processing. And, and a lot of this is covered in the, in the blog post as well. So you anonymize the data, remove emails, IP addresses, and, and secret keys, those types of, um, of things. Uh, we remove auto-generated code, so just regex to, to detect auto-generated code, but um, there's also some other heuristics, things to, to detect Java, uh, minified code, for example, like minified JavaScript. Um, we also remove code that doesn't compile or is not parsable. And so you can only do this for certain languages because you need packages that allow you to tell, you know, does this piece of code compile in a, in a particular language? Um, and then we do some pretty standard filters based on average line length, maximum line length, um, alphanumeric characters, and so on. Um, so now I'm gonna zoom in to a particular portion. This is the tokenizer and vocabulary training part of the pipeline. And so <laughs> um, this is, for those of you on this side of the room that can actually see it, the, um, okay, great. <laughs> Um, the, this, this is the process where you have some pre-processed training data. So you've already been through all the steps that we just discussed on the last slide. And now you want a tokenizer or, or you want a version tokenizer that has a custom vocabulary. And then you're gonna take that tokenizer and, and tokenize the, um, the, your process training data before you feed it onto the, to the model. Um, so the tokenizer is actually made up of, of two things. One is the algorithm, and then the second part is, is the vocabulary. And a lot of these standard tokenizers are available from, from Hugging Face. It's one of the great things about the Transformers repo. You can just download with one line of code or two lines of code the, the tokenizer for a lot of really popular um, open source models. Um, what we did was we trained our own custom vocabulary from the underlying training data. So if I go back for a second here, we did some sampling of pre-processed training data, tokenized based on that, and then saved the versioned tokenizer as a, as a ghostwriter tokenizer. Now, why do we do that? Well, it turns out that actually you can get pretty far with a custom tokenizer, and, or sorry, custom vocabulary, and uh, it has a lot of benefits for your model throughout the process. So specifically, you can allow for domain-specific vocabulary. And um, in this particular case, our domain 
is, is code. And we're not really interested in writing as much natural language as we are in, in producing code. It's a code completion model trained on uh, 20 languages or so, 20 different programming languages. And so it's much better to have a vocabulary that um, is more representative of, of code. And you can actually see here a comparison between the Codex vocabulary and the Ghostwriter uh, vocabulary. And Codex, even though it sounds like a, a code vocabulary, it's actually the original uh, Codex tokenizer um, simply used the GPT-2 tokenizer. So it's very much a natural language tokenizer with some key differences in how it handles white space. So when you get on the, on the left with Codex, when you get 4,000 or so, um, uh, uh, vocab token strings into the, into the vocabulary, you're still talking natural language. It's discussing politics of some sort with minister or French. Um, on the right, uh, Ghostwriter is still very much writing code, 4,000 uh, tokens into the vocabulary. And, and the way that these are, are sorted is basically how important this is in the, in the corpus of the vocabulary. So you can imagine why the Ghostwriter uh, vocabulary would be a lot um, more helpful here because you can then encode more information into the same number of tokens at any point in your model. And so that means you have a smaller vocabulary size, which means faster training and faster inference as well. Now, this also comes at a cost. So when you have a smaller vocab, um, there's, a, there's a chance you can miss things and there's a chance that certain languages or certain uh, types of completions won't return very good, good results. And here's a good example of that. Um, I, I had what this translates to in my speaker notes, uh, but I can't see them because I'm using my own laptop. But uh, it's, it's Bengali and it, I picked out an example where, um, where that, that original token, the original piece of text is not available in the Ghostwriter vocabulary, but is available in the Starcoder vocabulary, which is uh, closer to um, the Codex vocabulary. And so then what happens here is you can see the comparison for, for Ghostwriter versus Starcoder. Starcoder can represent this text and every single token that, that it returns to the model is going to have some specific value. In Ghostwriter's case, you get these, these question marks because these are uh, pieces of the vocab that the model hasn't, hasn't seen before. And, and how does that actually translate to model performance? Well, those missing vocab uh, um, strings are then seen by the model as this unknown token. And so it just introduces a lot of noise. And if you're not careful about uh, covering various languages or only covering specific portions uh, of a language, you can find that a model will perform significantly worse for a subset of a language or a programming language or anything else. Um, one thing I'd highly recommend if you're training your own tokenizers is to look for these kinds of, of edge cases. And uh, the, the way I even found this was to um, look for tokens that are in the Starcoder vocab, but not in the Ghostwriter vocab, and then sort them by length of the token. And anytime you have a single character there, it's definitely something you want to take a look at and make sure that you know, a few additional tokens might give you entire coverage of the whole language. Um, model training will be the next portion. I'll go over this part um, pretty, pretty quickly. A lot of this is covered in the blog post as well. So the first thing you have to do is specify your model and you wanna choose the specifications according to your requirements. So model size and architecture, obviously bigger models will get you um, better inference and, and better performance, better transfer learning and, and other types of capabilities that you get out of large language models. Um, but they'll come at, at a cost of, of inference, complexity, um, hosting will be more difficult if it's too large of a model and so on. Um, you also have to pick out your training objective. And so most LLMs that, that we use are uh, causal um, LLMs and so they just predict the next token, but uh, there's also fill in the middle objectives and special token um, objectives and, and other types. And so for coding, you could imagine fill in the middle is really useful. You might have uh, you know, some code after where your cursor is in a file and some code before and you wanna fill that out. Um, the Ghostwriter objective is actually not fill in the middle, um, but we trained a, a UL2 version of, of that at one point. 
Um, then there's the attention mechanisms. And so these are um, you know, choosing between, for example, multi-head attention or, um, or having like flash IO uh, attention mechanisms. And these are new features that kind of come out all the time. Um, some of them work, people pick them and, and train with them. We used flash attention uh, at, at Replit and it um, works well. There's different types of uh, embeddings and whatnot. There's, there's tons of different specifications here that you can do an entire presentation on. And um, the, the key thing to know here is that these things are always evolving and there's always some new kind of optimizer or new uh, attention mechanism and, um, and, and you just have to kind of read up on what the latest thinking is, what, if, whether or not anyone's tried it and, and choose it, uh, whether or not you want to try to train with this actual uh, specification. Now, once you've picked that specification, uh, it's really easy to train on Mosaic from there. So some of the things that Mosaic provides and, and the reason that we went with them uh, at Replit, uh, the first is just GPUs from multiple cloud providers. And, and you can get this without having to sign up for that cloud provider. So we actually, uh, Replit is very much a, a GCP shop, but GCP doesn't have uh, for their, for their GPU training, they don't have um, uh, multi-host training uh, available. And so uh, in order to move to say Amazon or Azure, we would have had to set up accounts with them, service accounts and um, a, a lot of other things that would have introduced overhead. And one nice thing about Mosaic is you can stream your data to the, to the cloud provider and you don't, it's never stored there and you don't have to go through the process of signing up. They also have a bunch of uh, well-tuned LLM training configurations for some of the common model architectures. And so some of the parameters that we looked at on the, on the previous slide are kind of picked out for you in a way that you get um, high throughput on uh, training for, for your GPUs, you get good model performance, and, and they cover a lot of the common kind of um, model architectures and training loops and objectives. Then managed infrastructure, so uh, fault tolerance for some of the, of the GPUs, getting them back up. We don't wanna have to manage GPU infrastructure, which, which we did do at one point. Um, originally, we, we used to manage our own training infrastructure and we just found that this was a lot easier to do. Uh, and then finally, just a CLI for kicking off training runs as well. And then you hopefully get pretty loss curves and they hopefully come down. Um, I won't talk about uh, data determinism here, but um, if you get spikes, or I'll just very briefly mention it, if you get spikes in your, um, in your loss uh, curves, you can uh, go and try to uh, enforce data determinism so you can figure out exactly what data was fed into the model to, to produce the spikes. Okay. Uh, model evaluation next. So this is a very um, difficult thing to do. I'll, uh, I'll focus specifically on, on the code use case and what um, we did at, at Replit. So uh, the way we actually evaluate the model and tell is this model any good is uh, using something called human eval. And human eval is a framework designed uh, originally by OpenAI. And the way it works is that you have uh, a piece of of text that you feed into the model. So this is the input here on the left. And it's a set of comments that says uh, to write a function that in this case returns a sum of numbers from one to n. And um, you might give an example, and this is the, this is the kind of test that you feed into the, into the model. And then on the, on the right hand side, the model produces this output. So it writes uh, what it thinks um, Will, will come next, and so it writes this function for you. And what you can then do is um, feed in a test. So, you, so this is just kind of like unit testing. You would pass uh, a test where you would expect um, a certain uh, outcome from, from this function, sum of numbers, and then check if, it's, if the function written by the model produced an output that you would have expected. And so it's very simple in that, um, in, in concept. And you would run this, uh, I think there's 162 or, some, or something like that, uh, test cases in, in the original human eval data set. And um, you would run it across all of them and you get usually a pass at one 
score, which will tell you the percentage of times that the model was able to uh, complete the function correctly on the, on the very first try. Now, uh, model evaluation is a, is, is a very, very uh, difficult thing to do. I started to write this slide and I noticed like the first three bullet points have the word difficult in them. Um, but it's true, it is difficult. And uh, you can give an entire presentation on this. I, actually, I think the CTO of Mosaic is giving an entire presentation on this um, in, in one of these sessions. And it's difficult to do even for models, like if you're trying to com uh, compare GPT-4 with, with Claude. And so you can imagine how much more difficult it could be for your own models that, that you're training uh, from scratch. And a lot of the out-of-the-box metrics that are um, uh, various natural language uh, tests. So, you know, we previously, we talked about um, human eval, which is a code uh, metric. There are tons of these natural language metrics and they might not be right for you based on the type of model that, that you're training. So Replit's code completion model is a great example of that where um, sure we, we test natural language capabilities and we care about that, but it's really a code completion um, model and, and you may have a very different uh, use case and and, and those metrics may not be as, as valuable to you. Then the other thing is that um, generation may actually be different than evaluation. And this is a really important one, and one you wanna think about really carefully when you're uh, deciding to, to train your model and deciding what you want, actually wanna get out of um, uh, the, or, or how you wanna be able to tell that your um, training is actually working. And so what do I mean here? Well, in this code example, there's a there's what the model can do as it's training, and what it does here is it returns some code. But but then for us, there's actually this additional step of running that code that was returned to see is the result uh, the same as what we would have expected. And and in this case, in human eval, it's actually the easiest uh, thing to do because this is Python code. Um, the original human eval only covers uh, uh, Python functions. And then the Hugging Face Transformers library has a function to actually evaluate that code. And so you don't really need to work outside of transformers, but then when you're trying to process code that's written in Rust, in Go, in any other kind of languages that you don't have a readily available execution environment in, it's actually much harder to tell, uh, did this produce the right code and do that in, in systematic fashion? And um, so in this case, what you really do is you end up separating generation from, from evaluation. So you can still ask the model to print, uh, to, to generate all of this Rust code, but then you have to go at some point and, and execute that code somewhere to be able to tell was this uh, result correct. And typically you don't wanna do that on the same GPU or can't do that on the same GPU that you're, that you're training on. And there's some more extreme cases of this. I mean, imagine if you're doing some kind of uh, protein synthesis or, um, or or something like that, you might get a bunch of, of protein sequences back and then like have to take them to a lab or, or something to figure out did this actually work out. So um, th this is a, a very important thing to keep in mind of how, how are you actually going to be able to tell that your model's performing well. Um, and then lastly on this, uh, even if you score well on these metrics, that doesn't mean necessarily mean you actually have a good model. And, and the way I think of it is just like one instrument um, and, and you want as many of them as possible uh, to, you know, when you're, when you're flying through this process. Um, so I'm running low on time. I'll, I'll try to go through this part of it pretty quickly. Um, this is deployment into production process. Um, so Replit had, had previously built uh, our our inference stack for Ghostwriter v1, which was based off of the CodeGen uh, Salesforce model. And so in that diagram, uh, you'll see at the, at the bottom of it, um, the, or in this section, there's really no provider here, and, and we just kind of built that part of it ourselves. But you might want to consider other services like, you know, Mosaic has inference, and, and uh, tons of other places are offering these kind of managed services as well. Our stack was a faster transformer and Trident inference server. And then we already did a lot of auto scaling uh, with Kubernetes, although there are some like new unique challenges that are related to the GPUs and, and model size requirements. There's also a lot of pre and post processing involved as well. And so that's an important thing to think about. 
Uh, again, it depends very much on your use case. Um, the, there's server-side logic, things like batching and caching and so on on the, um, on the server, but then there's also a lot of client-side stuff. And so in the code use case, you want to do things like find all the relevant context, um, and then when the response comes back, do things like bracket matching. And, and this stuff, especially if you have a user-facing product, makes a huge impact on, on the user experience. So lessons learned from, um, from this process. So uh, you want to think really carefully about how you're going to evaluate your model. That would be the number one thing, is if you're going to train your own model, uh, first sit down and kind of think, how will I know that I've got a good model? Because this is going to help you um, tremendously throughout the entire process. The other thing is create a really rapid iteration loop early on for, for testing your model. And what I mean for that, uh, by that is not this kind of like systematic testing like human eval, but just the ability to run against it, get a, submit a request, get a response, um, what, what do we call model vibes at, at Replit. Like you just want to code with it and see how it feels. Um, and then tie your entire process together. Uh, so your training loop will often affect your inference stack and so on. You don't want to end up in a situation where um, you know, your, your inference stack can only handle a certain type of model um, specification, and then you're just going to, you, you might still get generations, you'll just get generations that are worse or, or suboptimal. And then finally, be patient. The whole process takes time, and, uh, and that's, you know, think of it as a, as a model training marathon. Um, now, the n number one reason that people want to train their own large language models, as I said earlier, was customization. And this can mean very different things to, to different people, but typically the number one thing that people say is, um, I want to use the large language model with my own data. And um, what does that actually mean? Well, there's, there's three different approaches that you can take here, and they have increasing cost and, and customization. And all of these can mean some form of using LLMs with, with your own data. So on the left, we have prompting with context. This is just regular prompting, really. And um, it's limited to the context length of the model. It's the same exact way you're using GPT-4 or, or Claude right now. Um, the weights are completely unaffected, and you'll, you'll never see them uh, or have access to them, but you can, you can still uh, prompt and in some cases give the model uh, the right information uh, that it needs to answer a question for you. And so there's the standard prompting and then retrieval-based augmentation, which is really the process of just getting information and putting it in the prompt as if you had written it in, in yourself. Um, so let's look at a quick example of that. Um, I think that this is, uh, this is one of the things that's really often talked about, but it's, it's kind of difficult to um, wrap your head around the first time that you see it of, of how simple of a process this can be. So uh, here's an example where a user asks, how do I add a new API key to my REPL? And so we would want to do this in Ghostwriter chat and, and have Ghostwriter chat be able to tell you things about Replit, even though the underlying model might not know uh, about Replit. And so really the process looks like this. You, you go into the Replit docs, you fetch um, the context from a, a series of help articles that are likely to contain the answer. And then you just put those in, in the context and you pass that to the language model. And so um, this is the actual prompt that we would pass to the LLM. It's not verbatim, but close to this, where you would say, answer, this answer the following question using the context below. There's the user's question. How do I add a new API key to my REPL? And then the context is literally just the help articles, the text from those help articles uh, that, that you retrieved. And then the LLM just returns an answer. And um, the, the key difference here is how you retrieve those um, those articles, how do you determine that you know, secrets and environment variables, uh, build a paid content site with Replit Web and Stripe and so on are, are the most relevant here. And uh, that's what you use uh, in, you know, embeddings for and semantic uh, similarity search. Then there's fine tuning. Now, fine tuning is a very all-encompassing term. And, and whenever people use it, they are actually referring to a, a number of different things. Um, but Typically, they're referring to like supervised uh, or, or unsupervised fine tuning. And, um, and then there's instruction tuning as well. 
uh, RLHF, which is slightly different from, from the two of these. Uh, and this is a you know, medium to high complexity thing. And then of course, training from scratch is, is uh, much higher complexity. But there is a sort of spectrum between fine tuning and training from scratch. And, uh, and it's, it's much more of a blended spectrum than you might think. So why is fine tuning actually so difficult? And, and why is it so hard for people to, to do this correctly? Well, any number of reasons. One is custom data. So you might have domain specific knowledge that isn't actually covered in your uh, original data set. And, and that can affect your, your vocabulary coverage. And so if you have custom enough uh, domain data, then you might, if you think back to the vocabulary, there might be um, pieces of vocabulary the model's never seen before, or sequences of that vocabulary that the model's never seen before. So keep in mind, these models are really good at predicting what comes next um, with a series of tokens when they've seen that series of tokens in the past. And so it's, if it hasn't seen the series of tokens, it's not gonna do as well. There's also varying data formats. And so what I mean by this is you might have, for example, um, uh, text data, right? So uh, a lot of the stuff in ChatGPT or any of the documents fed in, it's not gonna be of that short form kind of SMS data. And so if you're trying to train a model to return conversation of two people in a text message chain, it's gonna be diff more difficult for it to do that. Um, there's also this time dimension of data. And so um, data is constantly changing and, and facts about the world are changing. Here's an example of of uh, three different statements you can make about NVIDIA. And if you, you can imagine if you have an LLM that's trained on uh, financial services, you have on the left pieces of information that are very foundational. This is foundational to the model. It should go into the model in the, in the uh, training data set. Sure, it could change, but it's, it probably won't change in the time that you're gonna train a new model. And then in the middle, you have something like a product description which is gonna change, it might change quarterly or whatever when the latest flagship AI chip comes out. And then on the right, you have things that change like literally every second. So uh, between now and the time that I had written this slide, I'm sure this number is different. And this is really something that should go through a database query to, to look up. I also had just some quick examples of custom domain data as well for, um, for fine tuning and why uh, some of this stuff might be difficult to do if, you're, if your corpus is custom enough. In, in terms of uh, other reasons why, why fine tuning is so difficult, um, it also depends a lot on your downstream use case. So some of it might be, are you trying to replace some knowledge that, didn't, uh, that you don't want the model to actually do? Um, or are you trying to, so, so the information retrieval case, like you want this model to know the team that LeBron James plays for and you don't want it to get it wrong? Um, or do you, are you trying to do generation, in which case if you overtrain or over fine tune the model and teach it to rely very heavily on that weight, you kind of lose out on its ability to generate uh, things for, for say content generation. Okay, and then we'll quickly do some LLM hot takes, uh, <laughs> things that'll get me booed off the stage maybe and then uh, leave five minutes for Q&A. Okay, so first hot take is that fine tuning doesn't work, um, at least not for new domain knowledge that I've seen. And uh, everyone right now, what they're trying to do is, oh God, I'm gonna get in trouble for this. Um, everyone is uh, basically taking a foundation model and trying to fine tune it and teach it some knowledge that it doesn't currently know. And I haven't seen a, a single example of of someone being successful at this, uh, despite everyone currently trying. And that doesn't mean that instruction tuning doesn't work. Instruction tuning very much does work. And Dolly is a, is a great example of that. Um, and, and another <laughs> caveat is it's mostly unsupervised fine tuning that, that doesn't work. Um, and that's presumably, people are presumably doing unsupervised fine tuning because it's difficult to do uh, th this whole thing correctly and for all the reasons that I mentioned in the, in the prior slide. Um, you're probably using embeddings wrong. <laughs> Spicy. Um, you might just need a database and not exactly a vector database and your embeddings might not be optimal for, for your use case, but 
it's usually not that big of a deal and um, the, the use case won't really matter all that much, but just know if you get really deep into this world that there's probably a lot of things that you can do uh, to, to optimize your use of embeddings. Uh, probably the most controversial one. So agents will mostly go away. Um, they can do a lot of useful things and when something is useful and repeatable enough, I think that these things are just gonna get baked into the model. And tool use is a, is a good example of that. Um, so, you know, you had Toolformer, StructGPT, Gorilla, all of them teaching the model in some way to, to use a tool in one form or another, and now uh, uh, OpenAI's functions capability. Um, and when they do come back, they'll have actual, you know, reasoning capability and knowledge, and, and that won't be good for the rest of us. Um, no one actually knows the right mix of, of data. So this is, this is something you read in papers all the time where someone's like, oh, my recipe for this is, you know, this much GitHub and that much C4, and then I like to sprinkle a dash of like this other data in there. The, the truth is these training runs are so expensive and no one wants to deviate from, from these existing norms. Basically, someone picked something that seemed plausible and the rest of us were just like, okay, that makes sense. And we could all very much be at a local maxima or, or not even that. Um, and it gets worse, which is even if you do have, and there are papers with a lot of these variations and the mixture of, of pre-training data, but then there, you have way too many moving parts. Um, so everything that we talked about back in uh, you know, the model specification slide uh, are all moving parts. None of this stuff is done you know, in, in, a, in a vacuum that allows for app, Apple comparisons. And by the way, there's no good way to evaluate any of them. Remember, we can't even really easily evaluate GPT-4 and Claude. Um, so how the heck are we gonna evaluate these things even if we didn't have, you know, the, the various moving parts? And then lastly, um, I believe that it's going to be your data and not GPUs that are gonna be your bottleneck very soon. And so, um, GPUs are hard to access now, sure, but there, there's more coming online, their training capacity will continue to increase, and when that happens, much of the iteration in your process is going to actually occur at the data layer. And so if you don't have the right tools to iterate on that quickly, to work through the pipelines and, and the workflows and evaluate your model and then go back and switch up your data, mixture and test that whole process, then that's gonna be your biggest bottleneck in, in this entire process. Um, that's it, so if you have questions, feel free to get in touch um, or go over to lexi.ai and sign up for our, our mailing list.